You are welcome to this introduction to Acts chapter 18, intended for those who study alone or who lead men's discussion groups. If you are facilitating discussion, then here are six recommended tasks to solicit an opening prayer, then to introduce the passage. You should touch on geography, history, and culture, present a working outline of the book, and then a few learning goals for this session. During the discussion, invite someone else to read aloud, then ask for others' comments, queries, and applications before you offer your own. And then, of course, share your own views and opinions. Fourthly, provide scholarly explanations that you have gleaned from your study. This might include word definitions and points of Greek grammar. Give a summary of various interpretations of the passage and illustrate its principles from experience. Conclude the session by asking, What have we learned? What shall we do about it? What shall we ask God to do? Finally, solicit a closing prayer. Point out that we are in Paul's second missionary journey after he had been to Thessalonica and Berea, from whence he was sent to Athens before going on to Corinth, and from Corinth to Sancreia. Here is a working outline of the book of Acts that you may choose to employ. Building upon Jesus' promise, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Quickly note that the first section dealt with Jesus' promises, how the apostles would witness in Jerusalem and Judea, then how other believers witnessed in Judea and in Samaria. Note how the apostles began their witness to Gentiles, how Jerusalem affirmed the conversion of Gentiles without their having to become Jewish. Section 6 deals with Paul preaching the gospel to the Greeks. The book will go on to recount Paul's preaching the gospel to the Romans. We are currently in section 6. In chapter 17, we shall try to learn what to do when your community resists the gospel, what to do when enemies bring false charges against you before the courts. For missionaries, what is the optimal gospel team size? And what is a sufficient time for a missionary team to stay in a city before they move on? Provide a backdrop to this chapter. How whilst Silas and Timothy were in Macedonia, Paul, having no teammates in Athens, rather than planting churches there, traveled 40 miles west to Corinth. The city of Corinth had been destroyed under the Roman Republic and left desolate for a century until it was rebuilt as a Roman colony by Julius Caesar from about 44 BCE becoming a center of commerce, culture, and entertainment. Note that the Roman emperor at this time was Claudius, who reigned between 41 and 54 CE. Sometime between the years 49 and 53, he expelled all Jews from Rome. This apparently included Christian Jews. The Roman historian Suetonius, who wrote during the reign of Hadrian, said, Since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Crestus, the emperor Claudius expelled them from Rome. Some Christian and Jewish scholars suggest that the term Crestus was a Latinized form of the title Christ, referring to Jesus. Hence the disturbances may refer to conflicts amongst Jews over Jesus, who some came to believe was the Messiah. Have someone read aloud verses 1 through 3, or stop the video and read for yourself. 
Then consider, how did God sovereignly bring together a new church planting team for Paul? The point is made that Aquila and Priscilla were originally from Pontus, one of the cities to which the gospel was taken by Jews who had been present in Jerusalem at the Feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended and many thousands of Jews became followers of Jesus. Stop and read verses 4 and 5 or have someone read them aloud. Note that the text literally says that Paul was convincing both Jews and Greeks, that he was devoted to the word whilst witnessing to the Jews. Read verses 6 and 7. Then ask, when should one leave an ethnic community and go work with another? Talk about how various communities become receptive to the gospel at different times. Where did apostles plant new churches? Note that Paul planted the first church in Corinth in the house of a man named Titius Justus. Read verse 8. The Greek term used for official of the synagogue referred to one whose duty it was especially to take care of the physical arrangements for the worship services. The Greek term translates the Hebrew Rosh HaKneset, Knesset being the modern Hebrew term for the Israeli parliament. Discuss who baptized most of the new believers at Corinth since Paul did not. He wrote later to the Corinthians, I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. It became a common practice in the New Testament era for ordinary believers to baptize those whom they led to faith in Jesus. To this day, it makes a good tactic to help the gospel flow rapidly through a community. Read verses 9 through 11. Note that the promise, I am with you, reflects Joshua 1, 9, and other texts. When Jesus says, I am, he's making himself equal to Yahweh. By saying, I am with you, he is giving the same promise that Yahweh gave to Moses, to other leaders of Israel, in fact, to the entire nation. Consider, when did the many become the Lord's people? Is this a reference to predestination? See verse 8. Jesus may have been referring to the many who had already become believers. Then ask, what should a competent church planter be able to accomplish in 18 months? Church planters who follow the pattern that the apostles laid in the book of Acts can see similar results in a receptive population. Read verse 12. The proconsul, meaning an assistant consul, was Lucius Junius Gallio Ananus, who lived between 5 BC and 65 CE, son of Seneca, the famous rhetorician. Rome appointed Gallio proconsul of the newly constituted senatorial province of Achaia, which included the city of Corinth. Thus, these events likely took place between July and October of 51 CE. Read verses 13 through 16. Note that the accusation here may have been that Paul was preaching an illicita religio, that is, an illegal religion. Thus, Paul could have been punished by Roman law. The outcome, however was a denegatio acciones, that is, the case was dismissed. Read verses 17 and 18. Jews would have their hair cut to signify the end of a Nazarite vow. We do not know what Paul had vowed. Discuss together what was significant about Galileo's decision 
in Paul's case. Galileo effectively recognized Christianity to be a sect of Judaism, a legal religion, thereby protecting Paul from accusations of spreading an illegal religion. This decision was communicated to other Roman cities where Paul would go first to synagogues. Why do you suppose Paul stayed longer in Corinth than in other cities? Well, this was an important commercial hub with a population size of between 80 and 100 thousands. The population proved receptive of the good news and Paul was legally safe from attack by the synagogue. Furthermore, his tent-making or manufacturing business prospered during the Ismithian Games of the year 51, providing Aquila and Priscilla and himself with a comfortable income. From Corinth, Paul would cross the Isthmus to the city of Sancreia, where he took passage for Ephesus. Have someone read aloud verses 19 through 21. Ephesus was an ancient city, centuries earlier, called Apassos, which was sacked by the Hittites in the 14th century BCE when the Hebrews were first arriving in Canaan. Note, how was Paul's reception here different from that in other synagogues? And why do you suppose that was? From Ephesus, Paul will travel to Caesarea, which is the port city, then go up to Jerusalem, from whence he would go down to Antioch in Syria. Read verses 22 and 23. Why did Paul go so far out of his way to pass through Jerusalem before going to Antioch? What do we know happened in Jerusalem with Paul before he undertook his second missionary journey? Was he giving a report to the other apostles? Now, how do we strengthen disciples? Obvious replies include teach the scriptures, apply the power of Jesus' name over evil, and learn to lead your life in the power of the Holy Spirit. But also, explain how to defend their legal status before the government. The book of Acts underscores the ministry of Apollos. Read verses 24 and 25. Whom had Paul left behind in Ephesus? Priscilla and Aquila had learned from Paul how to minister the word of God as well as how to plant new churches. What New Testament book might Apollos have written? And what was the baptism of John? Stop and read verse 26. Discuss together, what more than boldness does one need in order to have a more effective ministry? Then, what more did Apollos need to know about Jesus? Consider his resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the role of baptism in Christian conversion, and the openness of Gentiles to the same gospel. We note that the verbs to take aside and explain are both, are both plural in their form. Does God allow women to train men for ministry? Read verses 27 and 28. Clearly, from other passages, we learn that Paul put a great deal of confidence in Apollos, who often would teach in churches that Paul had founded. So you might ask, what New Testament book is written in very fine Alexandrian Greek, defending grace over law, and teaching Jesus' Messiahship by employing more First Testament proofs than any other book with approval of the Apostle Paul. Of course, we're talking about the Epistle to the Hebrews. Summarize 
what we learn about Apollos of Alexandria from the book of Acts, from the epistle to the Corinthians, and the epistle to Titus. Apollos was ethnically Jewish, Greek-speaking from birth, a competent teacher of the Jewish law. He knows the way of the Lord, is fervent in spirit, able to teach about Jesus, speaking in synagogues, and teaching about grace. Furthermore, he refuted opponents in public, proving that the Messiah is Jesus. Paul trusted Apollos to teach, admitting he was a better teacher than Paul himself. Apollos won many to Christ. The Apostle Paul approved of his writings. He was careful to follow the Lord's will and was informed by the lawyer Zenus, that is, a teacher of the Mosaic law. To conclude your session, pose these three queries. What did we learn from this passage? What shall we do about it? And what should we ask God to do?